This is a Course in Miracles. It is a required course. Only the time you take it is voluntary. Free will does not mean that you can establish the curriculum. It means only that you can elect what you want to take at a given time. The course does not aim at teaching the meaning of love, for that is beyond what can be taught. It does aim, however, at removing the blocks to the awareness of love's presence, which is your natural inheritance. The opposite of love is fear, but what is all-encompassing can have no opposite. This course can therefore be summed up very simply in this way. Nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. We're back. <laughs> a reading from Chapter 16, The Forgiveness of Illusions. And this is Section 1, True Empathy. To empathize does not mean to join in suffering, for that is what you must refuse to understand. That is the ego's interpretation of empathy and is always used to form a special relationship in which the suffering is shared. The capacity to empathize is very useful to the Holy Spirit, provided you let him use it in his way. His way is very different. He does not understand suffering, and would have you teach it is not understandable. When he relates through you, he does not relate through your ego to another ego. He does not join in pain. Understanding that healing pain is not accomplished by delusional attempts to enter into it and lighten it by sharing the delusion. Now, is this not one of the most useful lessons? Yeah. In terms of I, I agree. the critical uh, problem people have with, let's say, The Course in Miracles or the I idea of being cold. Uh, you're, you're cold. That, that's, you're being aloof from another person's pain, and mm -hmm. this is actually um, covering that. Right, it is, because... We're not, to, we're not to join in someone's suffering. And the only way to really uh, apply it always is to, you know, employ the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, we'll try to, we'll try so to figure it out. So join in another suffering. How do, you, how do we join in another person's well, suffering? What's the usual deal? Let's say, let's say I find out that someone has cancer or whatever. It's like, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, my mother went through cancer. And we usually relate it back to ourselves. Yeah, Missouri in loves way. company. Yeah, Missouri loves country. Missouri loves con company. So we like to um, share in the misery as, as opposed to um, understanding what empathy really is. And let's, let's be clear. We probably don't know what empathy really is. And that's why... Um, well, that's what this is all about. Yes. But, so my usual thing is I see someone suffering because mm -hmm. we deal with a perceptual framework. Mm -hmm. That's all we have. Right. So when someone is suffering, what happens? They're helpless. Mm -hmm. I feel helpless. There's nothing I can do to help them. Right. So the way that I help them is let me suffer with you. Yes. Let, let, me, let me share that burden. You know, uh, Simon of Cyrene carries Jesus' cross. He was sharing his suffering. Mm-hmm. You know, this is the way we interpret everything because we're in the perceptual framework. Right. I just want to set this up that this is a very, very important section. As I say that all the time, but this is a very, very important section for understanding how do I relate to the pain and suffering of the world? Not just of some person that talks right. to me, but of the wars, the, mm -hmm. the, the the problems with, you know, now we've got child trafficking amazing sexual abuse I mean, um, all these kinds of things that you know you just go wow I don't or or storms go through an area mm -hmm. and it just mows down the home wrecks a life right you know and so to not just commiserate literally to feel misery with them mm -hmm. without commiserating with them we feel we're being aloof cold and, and, and insensitive. So we, this is what this one's about, re-understanding what is effective action. Because you know sharing the burden of another by feeling their pain mm -hmm. is useless to both. Right. When it comes right down mm -hmm. to it, it may be a convention mm -hmm. that we have of a caring person. It's right. But it's conventional. It 
does nothing, makes them feel better. Is that what we think? Yeah, right. I, I'm not sure. About does it that. make you feel better if, let's say, your mom dies mm -hmm. and somebody says, oh, Joanne, my mom died and I feel terrible about my mom dying. <laughs> and so I feel terrible about your mom dying. We, mo we both must feel terrible right. about no. our moms dying. No, it does not make me feel better. No, it doesn't. It doesn't really work that way. But do you like? Do you like me to suffer? Do you like me to feel bad because you feel bad? I personally don't. Some people do. I know some people do. I, I no, I, I personally don't. Um, you know, my suffering is my own, and what is that really based on? It's based on my egoic sense that I can lose something in my life. Well, I give know? you what my my first my first hit. If somebody comes at me and says, "Oh, that's so sad." Yeah. I go, well, you don't know, because mm -hmm. I didn't feel sad. You yeah. feel worse than me. Mm -hmm. So my first thought is, there's a certain amount of insincerity here. Yeah. There's no way for you to feel my pain, mm -hmm. because number one, I didn't feel it that bad, and number two, how could you get into my shoes and feel it? We're different people. Mm -hmm. That's where I go with it, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So, so there's got to be a way that empathy goes somewhere. Right, right. And I, I guess we're gonna we're gonna find out now. Paragraph aren't we? two. The clearest proof that empathy as the ego uses it is destructive lies in the fact that it is applied only to certain types of problems and in certain people. These it selects out and joins with, and it never joins except to strengthen itself. Having identified with what it thinks it understands. The ego sees itself and would increase itself by sharing what is like itself. Make no mistake about this maneuver. The ego always empathizes to weaken, and to weaken is always to attack. You do not know what empathizing means. Yet of this you may be sure if you, if you will merely sit quietly by and let the Holy Spirit relate through you you will empathize with strength and will gain in strength and not in weakness. So what's happening with, with this, uh, the pain, both of us, you and I, something horrible happens. Mm -hmm. We're both being bombarded mm -hmm. in the perceptual realm with uh, the sense of anguish, the sense of loss, the sense of limitation and, and powerlessness. We don't know where to go. We don't know what to do. So we clutch onto each other and we both go down singing on the Titanic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But everybody dies anyway. Right. But suffering, um, the Holy Spirit never sees suffering because, I mean, it recognizes us as, as the Holy Son of God and not as the individuated uh, persona that we have taken on within this realm of this world that we have made. So, um, I mean, one of the, one of the lessons is, uh, I am the Holy Son of God himself. I cannot suffer. I cannot be in pain and I cannot fail to do all that salvation asks. Boom. You know, that's a lie because you feel pain all the time. Exactly. Well, true. And so, um, we need to know then we're mixing levels because what happens is I join in at the level of the illusion with somebody who's in pain. That's what happens. Or they do the same with me. So I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that as we read through this, that it, the Holy Spirit, by turning it over to the Holy Spirit, it takes it above the, the battlefield, as they say. Let me, let me give a, a, a small example. Let's, yeah. let's take, uh, let's take, you know, I take a balloon. You know, mm -hmm. I have a balloon, and I rub it on my, my wool sweater. Mm -hmm. I rub this balloon on the wool sweater, and I walk over, and I, I stick it on the wall. Mm -hmm. That's what I do. Um, what's the meaning? What, what's the meaning? Nothing. Static electricity, for some reason, I don't get it, makes the <laughs> balloon stick to the wall. Right. It's not sad. It, mm -hmm. it, it's not happy. Right. Right. It's just a phenomenon. And when the static electricity goes away, it falls down, and right. nobody's but, happy or sad either. Right, but what the Course is saying, I, what I hear it saying is, in the perceptual realm, the fact that when I cut my finger, when I am burned, you mm -hmm. know, when I stub my toe, it hurts. Mm -hmm. It is qualitatively no different than static electricity on a balloon. It's phenomenon. 
Yes. It's phenomenon. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. And at a level, now I know that, holy cow, I don't want the phenomenon of having my arm chopped off. But the, I do not want to be crucified. It's in the crucifixion time of year, and I do not want to be but crucified. The, but the, <laughs> my screaming nerve endings, or another person's screaming nerve endings, whether mm-hmm. it's physical or psychic, mm-hmm. um, that's what it is. It's a balloon that you rubbed on a sweater and you stuck it on the wall. You're looking at a, a certain sort of cause effect in the body, you right. know? If if you if I cut it, you know, and then the body heals back, and there's all this mm-hmm. phenomenon that comes in. Mm-hmm. The Course says, I have given everything I see all the meaning that it has for me. This is what it means. If th- The reason the balloon sticking to the wall has no meaning is because I haven't applied any meaning to it. Mm-hmm. Now, if I was in a bet with a friend, and I said, I bet this balloon sticks to the wall. Mm-hmm. And I rub it on my sweater and I stick it on. The friend says, no, it's not going to stick to the wall. And we made that bet. We, we, we mm-hmm. entered into a bargain with each other and it sticks. Somebody's going to lose 100 bucks or whatever. Mm-hmm. You understand? Pain is involved in that situation. Why? Because we invested an empty phenomenon with meaning. Right. Now, I know that that's a cheap shot because when my pain is at stake... Mm-hmm. It's much, much, it, it's almost impossible for me to divest right. of meaning in that. And for another person, we even have it like, well, I see painful person here. I mm-hmm. see painful person. I better feel pain or mm-hmm. I'm feeling less. See, I've invested that situation with meaning. Right. I need to feel pain for the other or I'm cold-blooded. You know, that's a teaching. It's something that we've learned. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the Course is saying in this, wait a second. You you are a bunch of children in a room making up rules so that you feel powerful. There's nothing effective here in doing that. The only solution is, children, wait for the teacher to come back in the room and solve this situation. That teacher is Holy Spirit. Yes, it is. You know, so that we don't decide... Mm Like, we're going to play doctor and fix things. No, it's not appropriate for me to say, oh, you cut, you're bleeding. Here, let me stick some whatever masking tape mm-hmm. on you. Or, you know, and the teacher says, wait a second, what's going on here? The teacher understands what's going on because the teacher, as you said, is a level up. Yeah, it is a level up. I mean, I have had, I had a sister right now who's gone through a traumatic pain. She ended up hemorrhaging after a colonoscopy. And um, got in a car wreck. Got, got in a car wreck. Because Broke her collarbone. Yeah, lost so much blood and everything else. And um, you know, being a large family, I heard it from a sister first and stuff like that. And um, I said, "So what do you do with it?" Well, I, I actually, what I did first of all was pray. I, I mean, that's my that's my personal go to is I, I sit down and pray. I prayed for her healing and I prayed for her peace of mind regarding the situation. Um, and, um, the thing of it is, is that I know that if there's something I truly can do for her, she will reach out to me, but I'm not, I'm, I'm miles and miles away from her right now that she's, there's her daughter flew in. There was these other people who, you know, while, while she was needing some extra care. Okay. But let's say you're next door. Forget that. Forget that. Let's say you're next door. The conditionalities are off. Let's forget that. Okay. You live next door. It's your dear sister. She's all busted up now. Do you bake her cake? Do you make her bake beans? Do you take it next door? Well, if she's conscious, what, what I do is I say, what can I do for you? That's all I can do is I say, what can I do? But for in you? terms of the course, what if she says you can make me some baked beans? You know, I mean, you can make me, you can bake me a cake. You can uh, reshingle I, my roof because I, I was going to do that and I can't because my collarbone's broken. What, in other words, the course is saying, let's get out of this racket. Right. Well, the thing of it is, is that how do you get out of that racket? The only way I get out of it is that I have to before I even go to her house, I have to say, Holy Spirit, please. Uh, um, work through me in the conversation, so I do not, I do not exacerbate this. In other words, I do not enter into the situation of you're suffering. We all suffer, and and you know this is the now way that the you're world. suffering. Now that you're suffering, now that you broke your collarbone, now that you broke your broke your femur, now that your house burned down, mm-hmm. now that you lost a a, a, a child in, in a war, now that mm-hmm. these things happen, now you're meaningful to me. Yeah. Now this is great because mm-hmm. now I can rise 
I can rise within myself and, and minister to your needs. And Father, mm-hmm. in other words, I need a world of pain mm-hmm. to rise and minister. Mm-hmm. This is the sickness. Right. This, it's a sickness. Mm-hmm. Because then we, we and yet, if a brother is in need of of something, you know, in those circumstances, I I wholly believe in in assisting with that. I mean, okay, and the, I still the, think that it's called the corporal works of mercy. Yes, you know, you take yeah. care of bodies. Bodies take care of bodies. Great. Okay, that's great. You go visit the sick. You you you. The you thing visit of it is, is that prison. you don't know whether or not the Holy Spirit's working. If 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 the act, if you're not, if I'm not joining in the conversation of the pain, then I don't think that that is enjoining suffering. If somebody is doing the extra work that couldn't happen while they're, you know, incapacitated from doing that work, I think that if there is something that can be done that alleviates the the perceived suffering, anything that brings in a sense of peace is going to be in accordance with the Holy Spirit. We, I do not know what those need to look like. I'm just saying, I don't know what they need to look like. But we've talked about this before. Mm-hmm. There's conventional solutions, conventional, mm-hmm. meaning there's forms of ministering to another person right. accepted by our society. Yes, write the card, bleed all over it, say it's say it's horrible, you know, mm-hmm. whatever. But realize it's conventional. It's not doing anything. You can enter into that But I'd say that it's important to be aware, I do not want to reinforce that person's sense of victimization, no matter how I enter into it. Mm -hmm. I don't want to reinforce what the Course calls the delusion or the illusion Mm -hmm. that pain is somehow meaningful. Pain and suffering has meaning in Mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. We, We want pain and suffering to have meaning because we, you know, we, all of us, we can rise to the occasion. You see at a funeral, suddenly everyone's important. You know, you go through their life, just yeah. bored, mm-hmm. dull zombies staring into the, into space. Mm-hmm. Somebody dies or has a problem. Suddenly we're all activated. Take 9-11 as an example. It takes a disaster for people to feel meaningful. This mm-hmm. is what the course wants to combat. Right. And it said right in the beginning right there, the clearest proof that empathy as the ego uses it is destructive lies in the fact that it's applied only to certain types of problems and in certain people. We do cherry pick. Yeah, we do cherry pick. Like, like um, <laughs> not to drag politics into it, some people were laughing and happy about Saddam Hussein or, or Gaddafi being right. absolutely mutilated as human beings. Not their own people. Not but... much empathy there. Yeah, right, right. Okay, so we cherry pick what we're happy about. Right, exactly, even at the suffering of others. And the Course is saying... yes. If a six-month-old child is abused in the way that Gaddafi was abused, mm-hmm. oh, my God, everybody starts wringing their hands and d- demanding justice or something to happen, and yet it happens to Gaddafi, and we go, <laughs> he deserved it, you know, or something. Yeah. You well, know how it happens we... with people on different sides of the football games. Oh, it, yeah, d- different sides of the game. Oh, oh it, my gosh. Too bad quarterback broke his leg. Too bad. <laughs> <laughs> I know. You know? <laughs> I know, exactly. I mean, there, that is not empathy. I mean... I mean, in other words, I gain, you lose. That's uh, you know, and the it's course all great. is saying that is the standard. That is how you know. Yes. That it's fake and useless and an yeah. ego game. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. Okay, three. Yeah. Your part is only to remember this: you do not want anything you value to come of a relationship. You choose neither to hurt it nor heal it in your own way. You do not know what healing is. All you have learned of empathy is from the past. And there is nothing from the past that you would share, for there is nothing from the past that you would keep. Do not use empathy to make the past real and and so perpetuate it. Step gently aside and let healing be done for you. Keep but one thought in mind and do not lose sight of it. However tempted you may be to judge any situation and to, to, and to determine your response by judging it, focus your mind only on this. And this is italics here. I am not alone, and I would not intrude the past upon my guest. I have invited him. We're inviting the Holy Spirit now. I have invited him, and he is here. I need do nothing except not to interfere. And it's a nice little rhyme there. 
Well, there's an interesting thing going on here is that there's an implication because it, it, then there's another video that someday I'll get up there that has to do with this. This faculty of judgment mm-hmm. that I, I, ju- I mm-hmm. Phil, I judge whether something's good or bad. That's right. That is, that comes, that's a, a degradation. It's a misinterpretation of the discriminating faculties that have been given to me as a conscious being, as a child of God. I have these an ability to discriminate between this and that to see the truth. That's why it's there, to see the truth. Mm-hmm. But in the form of judgment, I've decided to use it for myself. And, you know, So that's where the split is. I decay out of the idea of um, I just see something, and I have a reaction to it. I see it, and I see the truth. That's the happy dream. Yes. But I, in my life, have these judgments, and it says, "Do not judge." To determine your response by judging it, it says. Um, it's the last sentence before we get to the. Italics. However, tempted you may be to judge any situation, and to determine your response by judging it. Yeah. Keep one thought in mind, and do not lose sight yeah. of it. Yeah. Focus your mind only on that prayer yes that let's, joanna read yeah let's just repeat it again i am not alone okay i i'm not alone why am i not alone because i've invited in the holy spirit right right now yeah. i have a partner right and i would not intrude the past upon my guests okay i don't want to start uh leading the holy spirit right. helping him out right. with good information that i've got right mm-hmm. Le- leave it alone yeah. I've, I've, I've i've turned it over to the expert that that's right I have invited him, and he is here. So then we have to acknowledge that he's I here. asked him. He arrives. Right. I, I didn't ask him so that I could tell him stuff. Yeah, right. And I need do nothing except not to interfere. And, you know, that, that reminds me of our prayer life because we say the rosary almost every day. Well, it's every day, actually. And... Um, and so I need to keep this in mind because we'll often pray for specifics when that the Holy Spirit knows exactly what needs to occur. And we could probably just call out somebody's name and know that we feel that there's a need there and allow the Holy Spirit to now intercede. I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to think about that because I know that um, there's a tendency in interjecting what we think needs to happen with the world, with friends, with family, and things like that. And in all honesty, we don't even know what's right for ourselves. There's, so. an, there's, an, implication, there's an implication here. Now, you've got to have faith. You have to have faith to understand the implication is the Holy Spirit, as reinterpreter of my delusion into the happy dream, into uh, God's reality, it's, it's a constant flow. We talked about that. The Holy, the Holy Instant yeah. is a constant influx, constant, mm-hmm. constant. Why do I not get it? I'm jamming the signal. That's right. I'm jamming the signal with my judgment of a situation. Mm-hmm. If I can stop the jam, you know, think World War II communications. If I can stop jamming the signal, the signal from the Holy Spirit can come through. Right. My inner conversation, and this is where you've said so many times about getting centered, you know, whether it's centering prayer, some sort of meditation, mm-hmm. but with a focused meditation, with the idea that I have a partner out there that's waiting to get through the jam. Right. It's not like I have to go seeking the Holy Spirit. I'm immersed in the Holy Instant. Mm-hmm. And the only reason I don't have it available is because I'm jamming it. And it is suggesting in these moments where I want to share with another person their misery, mm-hmm. stop. Right, right. Stop, don't do it. Right, exactly. And um, after, after you've invited in the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> you need to trust that as you approach the person, the situation, You'll be given the right words. You'll be given the right thing to do. It'll be sort of a natural instinct that says, oh, this is what um, the Holy Spirit has me doing. (laughs) Paragraph four. True empathy is of him who knows what it is. You will learn his interpretation of it if you let him use your capacity for strength and not for weakness. He will not desert you, but be sure that you, that you not, uh, be sure that you desert not him. Mm-hmm. Humility is strength in this sense only, that to recognize and accept the fact that you do not know is to recognize and accept the fact that he does know. Mm-hmm. 
you are not sure that he will do his part because you've never yet done yours completely. You cannot know how to respond to what you do not understand. Be tempted not in this and yield not to the ego's triumphant use of empathy for its glory. You understand, ego doesn't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on. Nobody knows what's going on without the Holy Spirit's guidance. But by God, we recognize an opportunity to build ourselves up. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's saying. This is not empathy. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm also remembering, I mean, I talked quite a, it was a while now ago, um, well, because I do Meals on Wheels, and that one woman who was on uh, on oxygen, and she seemed to be suffering, and I actually wasn't sure if, when I left whether or not she was going to die right then and there, because uh, she was making all kinds of weird noises. But you get an overload. Like, you get a sensual overload. Yeah. I actually wondered if I needed to dial 911, and then, but I kind of checked in, and I said, if if she's on hospice, and she's in her dying mode... Um, I, my interference might actually prolong her suffering. I did check on her again. I said a prayer that she will be led, you know, through this with as little pain as possible because she was a new client. I mean, because I just started. And so anyway, um, the thing of it is, is that if you can hold back on your, re- your natural reaction right. to save somebody, to think that you have the right idea about something, um, I mean, unless it's an emergency and the person needs a tourniquet, I mean, let it be. Let let something else call in that prayer, call in the Holy Spirit, and so that it comes from another place. And I honestly think that the more you do it, the more you'll recognize that it is coming from someplace else because it's something that you wouldn't have thought to do or or not do in this particular instance. Um, without you know, it, once you learn what that feels like, because you know it's right because peace is upon yourself. And you know it's right because whatever you do brings peace to the other person, usually. So then you know that the Holy Spirit's working through you. That's the only thing I have to say about that. Right. A lot of time we're flying blind. Yeah, we are. I mean, we're literally flying blind. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of a a comic book that I got. I didn't really like World War II comic books when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. But I picked up one and I got it. And... uh, in it, it's called Flying Blind. Mm-hmm. And a guy has his instrument panel shot out uh, by an enemy airplane. Mm-hmm. And so the whole thing is about how he's maneuvering in space, trying to avoid enemy fire, and at the same time, not because he can't tell what gravity is anymore. He can't tell what forward or backward is anymore because his instrument panel's out, it's nighttime. And so he's relying on a a sense as he's flying and he's and he's headed straight into a windmill you know it's like in world war ii mm-hmm. so he's headed right into a windmill and he says am i going forward am i going up am i going down he can't tell and so he jerks his the stick up and he and he rips off one of the fins on one of these dutch windmills but he survives and it's like oh he missed crashing into the ground by a few feet my only point is there are times especially at a time like this where we are flying blind mm-hmm. we do not know how mm-hmm. We don't know how to relate in these empathetic things. And so all we can do is uh, due diligence with conventions. Mm-hmm. If the card is, send the card. Right. Bake the casserole. Wring your hands. Go to the prayer right. service, whatever. Mm-hmm. But realize that you're, those are empty motions in a meaningless world. That's really what they are. They are empty motions in a meaningless world. Mm-hmm. It's not. I'm not here to prove to anybody that I know more than them by not sending them a card right. or preaching to them about not giving them a casserole. I'm here to just recognize we're in a fix of mm-hmm. not knowing anything. Right. And 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 by my recognition and the invitation of the Holy Spirit, you get. Um, you're no longer jamming the signal. Mm-hmm. Now that that intuition that that pilot had in the comic book can come through. Mm-hmm. If he's staring into his instrument panel, which has been shot out, looking for guidance, he's going to crash. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, it's Luke. Follow. You know, use the force, Luke. Yeah. You know that kind of a yeah. thing. Just one more example of um, empathy or whatever. Just a situation, another situation that happened was that um, I have a friend who I rarely go into her house or anything. She's older. And um, 
and we go out to lunch and things like that. But I, I, she got sick, and she asked me to pick up some groceries for her, so I did. And uh, she wasn't awake, so I went into her house. Well, her house is a disaster. I mean, I was just like, oh, my gosh, garbage by the door, just one skinny row. She'd asked me at one time, she goes, could you help me clean up my house, you know, make, make organize it and stuff like that. Um, I actually had to check in on that one and everything else. How it got this bad, I didn't know or anything else. I did let it go. I thought maybe I would help her this spring, you know, based on just some things. But I found out through some other people, you know, and, and I've always prayed that she would, because it seems like a situation where perhaps she's depressed or something else. At any rate, I checked in on this. Do I help this person, you know, with this thing? She's older and the place is a mess and everything. Um, the question is whether or not she really really wants it or something else going on these are circumstances you don't know and um it's well, you know for you know for sure i do that know your judgment is she's depressed nobody should live like that yeah yeah my judgment is that but i have to let go of those judgments i mean because i don't really know let's just say i don't know or, or is it compassion and empathy to offer help and to clean it up i mean really let's use it for a second well, because a lot of the suffering i, we I run got into, to, in all honesty, by delaying, I got an answer because I found out that a couple of years ago, some people from the church actually did help her clean it all up. It, they did get it to a place, and it all just got packed full and a mess again. So that means something else is going on. So, so matter, so no matter how much I want to, you know, extend myself to perhaps help her get it organized and cleaned up again. Um, it, that's th that's not the problem. There's an other layer to the problem. Okay, well, let's look at it. L l you've got this person, and they're and then, whatever. So therefore, I have to definitely check in with the Holy Spirit right. as to what is the best thing I can be um, saying and doing with her, if anything. Right. Well, okay, so she's a hoarder. It's a mess. You've got judgments. Mm -hmm. Because you have judgments, if you were a hoarder, you would say, hey, this is great. But mm -hmm. you're not a hoarder. So you look at it, and you say... Something needs to change. Something ought to shift. Mm -hmm. And then you go, well, wait, I don't really know what's right. And then you get witnesses from the you're around you to say, well, maybe back off. You don't really know what this lady, she's already been through it. So the question is this, because it brings up, I think, an excellent point. To what extent do, should I be allowed, Joanna be allowed, and those people out there be allowed to crash and burn? Right, because we don't know what's best for them. We don't know what's in their highest and best well, interest. Well, I mean, okay, let's... I mean, and that's... If you watch, whether it's a child or a friend or some stranger, mm -hmm. and you can see that they are on the proverbial path to perdition, mm -hmm. you know that this isn't going well. Right, right. And that it's not going to go well, and that person they're hooking up with is going to be nothing but trouble, and that those financial decisions are going to ruin them, mm -hmm. and that they ought to really do this other side of a program to make their life better. Mm -hmm. And you got all these ideas... Um, where's freedom in this? I mean, in other words, I, people have the ability to make their choices, and that as a son of God, mm -hmm. and a, a, a part of me, they're mm -hmm. connected to me. You're connected to this lady. Mm -hmm. And as a connection, you, don't, you wouldn't live like that. Right. But, but that's not projection. You don't project yourself onto her and say, because I wouldn't live like that, I'm not going to let her live like that, mm -hmm. and therefore... Right. Clean her house she every did, week. No, I I know, and, and she did ask at one time, and I, I, knowing kind of her personality, I said, you know what, I'm just going to pray about it and see what happens. Now, a lot it went into the holidays, and I thought after the holidays, maybe you know, a whole bunch of things. But as a as a and, teacher, as a healer, mm -hmm. what is our role in this? Our our role is to listen and then act from that, not to not to react. So do you choose not to heal? Do you choose not to be a teacher? No, no. You, the, okay, so how do you teach and how do you heal in a hands-off situation? What do we do? In a hands-off situation, I have to call in the Holy Spirit, which I actually do through prayer. I mean, whatever that looks like. I mean, maybe, you know, maybe it's a prayer to Jesus. But for me, I have to go into some form. If it's not an emergency, I have to go into some form of reflection and say, Lord or Holy Spirit, what is my best role here? And usually what I hear is say, well, do your usual. Let's do no, a let, Let's just do okay. this, okay? okay? 
do your usual, go out to lunch with her and stuff like that, and you'll know what to say. It has to start in the conversation. But let's reverse it. I I just want to reverse it because I know there's strategies we can do with another person. I apologize big time for interrupting. It's just that that is that is calling in the Holy Spirit. I know. I know. That's what it looks like. No, no, that's exactly what the Holy Spirit is. I just want to say, what happens if you reverse the situation? Everything you've said about it Mm -hmm. says, "I am the active agent. Holy Spirit teams up with me." That person is an object in my world, but what happens if I say, give me your blessing, Holy Son of God, and that what I'm actually witnessing is a teaching for me. I don't know what it is. Oh, yeah, definitely. It's a teaching for me, and the teaching isn't, hey, kick hands off. No, am I getting something about hoarding? It, is something coming to me that, that I, if I relax my judgment mm-hmm. about them being a hoarder and me needing to contact God to help them out, if I can drop that... Well, and, yeah, and then now they're, they're, but they're the heavy. All, I'm not the heavy. Right. All reflections in our world are something that we need to. Um, so in take that situation, just for kicks, what happens if she's the heavy? You're the one that needs the, the instruction. Heavy, You're the one that I, needs the help. Okay, in the this prayers. is how I look at it. Um, a house is is particularly in dream in the dream um, world is considered your own personal mind conscience consciousness. So if a house is extremely cluttered, if this was happening in a dream. That means that um, I'm I'm too filled up with a bunch of ideas, and this so this is showing up for me. So then, even though I want to say she's got the problem, I have to look at myself and say, how many um, useless judgments, ideas, whatever I have going on in my life, um, are there blocking my own connection with God? What what am I carrying? around that kind of cluttered mindscape because a house is considered the mind in a dream and therefore if it's all cluttered up and you can barely make your way through it am i carrying that and actually i did at one time think about that about what i'm more conscious now than ever of what am i judging in my world and do i want to judge that because Every time you judge something, basically you crucify the other person and you crucify yourself. With every judgment I place out there, I hang the person on a crucifix and then I hang myself right beside him. Right. So, um, so suspending judgments is a great practice. That's all I can say. It's a great practice. One it thing won- that helps, though, is one thing I want to emphasize in terms of technique mm-hmm. is to not assume that I'm the center of the action. Well, that's true. What if that other person is the center of the action? Mm-hmm. And so I'm seeing a person that has a lot of issues that I feel like should change. Mm-hmm. What if I just turn off my little judge, mm-hmm. turn it off, and say, this person has come to me with a teaching, whatever it is. Right. You know, Again, deliver me. I don't want hard testing. Right. I don't want a guy coming at me with a knife and I have to figure out what the teaching is. Okay? Right. Right. I understand mm-hmm. that. But let's say I am in a situation where I'm weighing out what my appropriate response is. I can't love that person as long as I think they've got a problem. That's, I can't that's love. That's true. Absolutely true. It is impossible to love that person. Bloated, hoarder, narcissistic, whatever it mm-hmm. is. Mm-hmm. I can't, All those judgments. I can't love that person as long as that's what I see. Right. So that's the teaching. Right. The teaching is, wow, you get an opportunity to drop that stuff and mm-hmm. see this as a brother. Mm-hmm. The brother may be a hoarder. The brother may be in pain. The brother may be on oxygen. They may be at death's right. door. Whatever they are, mm-hmm. let them come to you as themselves. Right. Let them come to me. Let the brother mm-hmm. come to me as themselves. Well, and like the situation who, who the person was on her deathbed, basically. And, you know, and I realized I was afraid uh, even to be in the room. It's, you know, Beth, death's door is a weird, you can feel it in the room. So um, then I have to recognize I'm afraid. I'm afraid of my own death. You know, it's not hers that I'm afraid of. It's, I'm afraid of my own mortality. <laughs> she's already there. Yeah. She's <laughs> she's surrendering into it into, right. in her own way. And so I I have to recognize that, yes, that was a reflection of, well, how, how much do I feel like I need to protect this in order to feel like life is good, life is okay? Like, you know, how how attached am I to everything, you know, being working, you know, in the body? And, you know, as, as we age, 
things break down. That's eventually going to happen. Eventually it goes away. So Without um, forgiveness, I am blind. That's right. Without forgiveness, I am blind. Without forgiveness. That's a, that's a lesson. I am blind. Right. It's a great, it's a great one. Mm-hmm. So we need to forgive, and we need to drop our judgments. Let's go on. What are we on? Paragraph 5. The triumph of weakness is not what you would offer to a brother, and yet you recognize no triumph but this. This is not knowledge, and the form of empathy which would bring this about is so distorted that it would imprison what it would release. I didn't read that again. For some reason, I'm not taking that in. The triumph of weakness is not what you would offer to a brother, and yet you recognize no triumph but this. This is not knowledge, and the form of empathy which would bring this about is so distorted that it would imprison what it would release. The unredeemed cannot redeem, yet they have a redeemer. Attempt to teach him not. You are the learner. He is the te- he the teacher. Do not confuse your role with his, for this will never bring peace to anyone. Offer your empathy to him, for it is his perception and his strength that you would share, and let him offer you his strength and his perception to be shared through you. Okay, do you understand the beauty of this? That um, I am unable to share. I am unable to mm-hmm. feel empathy because I'm I'm in the nightmare. I'm in the perceptual uh, uh, gridlock. Right. The Holy Spirit is not absent from me. The teacher, the mm-hmm. redeemer. Yes. The redeemer is not absent from me. And so does that redeemer care? Uh yes, yes. absolutely. The, in fact, any possibility I have of a true empathy is through that agent of the Redeemer with a capital R. Yes, it is. I, I don't have any other means to really reach in with my wisdom to figure things out. And it's saying, recognize, please recognize. In other words, you know, it's like I've used this plumbing example. Yeah, I mean, if, if the task is over your head, call a plumber. Yeah. If the exactly. ta- and, and, and what it's saying here is the task of forgiveness, the task of seeing reality, the task of loving, the brother that comes to me in some mm-hmm. painful guise is over my head. Call the plumber. Call the redeemer. Yes. Yes. That, yeah. Don't try to do it yourself. So the triumph of weakness is not what, what you would offer to a brother. What it's saying is, is the ego, that's all the ego has, is, um, oh, look, see, in, in, again, back to the 9-11 thing where everyone is becomes very self-congratulatory mm-hmm. at funerals and in national disasters, mm-hmm. and they just say, look at how we all came together. Look how we all rose to the occasion. Why does it take a disaster? And, and, and are you really just bonding in pain? Right. Mm-hmm. right. Now, in that bonding in pain, there's something beautiful. I'm not dissing it. It's not mm-hmm. like you got a bunch of crazy people doing mm-hmm. that. There is a genuine, because I've had that experience in hurricanes, you know, where when the dust settles, people come out of their house, and suddenly um, there is a brotherhood. There's a, a commonality that lasts for right. about 15 minutes. Right. But it's there, Right. and then it goes away quickly. Mm-hmm. Because in situations where there's n- nothing you can do in the moment, is all you can do is look at the brothers who survived the thing where you could, there's nothing you could do and be grateful that you survived and they survived, and you know that's that is the brotherhood at that moment. Okay, paragraph six. Mm-hmm. The meaning of love is lost in any relationship that looks to weakness and hopes to find love there. The power of love, which is its meaning, lies in the strength of God that hovers over it and blesses it silently by enveloping it in healing wings. Let this be, and do not try to substitute your miracle for this. I have said that if a brother asks a foolish thing of you, to do it. But be certain that this does not mean to do a foolish thing that would hurt either him or you. For what would hurt one will hurt the other. That's an excellent thing because there's the, that's an excellent response because you need to take that into consideration because there was a lot of times when I thought this person is asking something at any rate go ahead well and what it is is if I build up a brother 
in their pain. Mm -hmm. and, and we're rife with that right now in, in our society of the, the culture of victimization yes, and right. identifying and, and developing strength and empowerment based on being victims. Yes. No, I don't care what that victimization is. Right. Yeah. Um, foolish requests are foolish merely because they conflict since they always contain some element of specialness. Only the Holy Spirit recognizes foolish needs as well as real ones. And he will teach you how to meet both without losing either. Mm -hmm. So we have a, a situation or we have a foolish request. We have special, we have special needs, uh, foolish needs as well as real ones. So there's mm -hmm. a real need there mm -hmm. and there's a foolish need. We don't want to lose either. A real need, like there's the call for love. Yes. And then, you know, there's a attack, you know, being a, a cry out for love, let's yes. say. I don't want to lose that call out for love. You know, the guy's attacking me with a knife and it's there's a call for love in there and I'm totally freaked out and all I want to do is run away, all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. I'm not saying I should stand there and take it or no jujitsu. You know, I'm just saying that we don't want to lose. In, in God's mind, there are no losses. Mm -hmm. And so the foolish request as well as the real request are all preserved. Mm -hmm. I can I can sort out this is and this is the true use of judgment. This is the true use use of discrimination, is to loan my mind to the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. That's that's how I use my judgment. I loan it to the Holy Spirit and say, "Show me the the uh, the, the ridiculous request, mm -hmm. the insane request, and show me the real request." Right. That's where we're weighing things out. Right. The yeah. tares and the wheat thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Paragraph seven. You will attempt to do this only in secrecy, and you will think that by meeting the needs of one, you do not jeopardize another because you keep them separate and secret from each other. That is not the way, for, for it leads not to life and truth. No needs will long be left unmet if you will leave them all to him whose function is to meet them. That is his function and not yours. He will not meet them secretly, for he will share everything you give through him. That is why he gives it. What you give through him is for the whole sonship, not for part of it. Leave him his function, for he will fulfill it if you will but ask him to enter your relationships and bless them for you. Okay, what, you know, this is pop quiz. What do you think it means by secrecy? I yeah I actually I stumbled over that you will attempt to do this only in secrecy and now what I had to go back foolish requests are foolish merely because they conflict since they always contain some element of specialness only the Holy Spirit recognizes foolish needs as well as the real ones and he will teach you how to meet both without losing either you will attempt to do this in only in secrecy what to tell the difference between what is real with the foolish need and the real need? It's it's part of the understanding of the language. I think it's a good opportunity just to kind of get a grip on the language that's used because secrecy in this case, I would say, I feel confident in saying this, it just means hidden. Mm. So that like if I if I develop a special relationship, it's secret because I don't really think that anybody will lose by this special relationship. Mm. In other words, I identify a certain person that needs healing, prayers, celebration, whatever it is that I want to throw at somebody. Mm -hmm. I just throw it at that one person, and, and, and I, see, I see no problem in that. Mm -hmm. That's secrecy. Okay. And the Holy Spirit will never, ever practice in secrecy. In other words, if I, if, if you identify because like... Because what benefits one benefits the whole sonship. Right. That example that you gave... Mm-hmm. The sonship comes to me in a fractal or holographic way. The sonship comes to me as one mm -hmm. with a capital O, one. It comes. So that if I've got this person, hoarder, whatever it is that they're up to, and I want to, I, I judge, mm -hmm. I have isolated them down to a case. Mm -hmm. When I call in the Holy Spirit, which and that's secrecy. Yes, that's that secrecy. is. That's yeah. secrecy. And when I call in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit says, I don't handle things in secrecy. In other words, you're identifying a problem. I understand that you're deluded and you think that this is just one person, one example, and you you have not generalized the lesson. Right. As the as it says in the course in so many places. You have not had the skill, the talent, the ability, the you're deluded. Mm -hmm. So you can't give a general lesson. Holy Spirit will 
give me a general lesson. So that person has come to me. Why? So that I can learn something about myself? So I can learn something about them? No, it's to heal the world. Right. That yes. person, that hoarder, that it, 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 situation has come to me. It might as well be World War Three. Mm-hmm. That person comes to me to heal the entire world. Yeah. Right. And that's the general teaching. Now, of course, I can't handle that, mm-hmm. but it's really, really worth it to understand that by finding that centering place and achieving that forgiveness. Of, in other words, I'm blind until I forgive, mm-hmm. calling in the Holy Spirit. When that forgiveness happens, the world is being healed. Right. It's not just that person. It's not just me. It's not just this little brotherly thing. Right. It's it's all of us as one. That's mm-hmm. seven and a half billion people yeah. or more. Right. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, is there anything else there? That is not the way for it. it leads not to life and truth. To do that in secret, no needs will long be left unmet. If you leave them all, and throughout this entire that thing. That is his function. Yeah, that's his function. Not yours. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No matter how, no matter how skillful I become, mm-hmm. no matter how wise and enlightened I can right. become, Holy Spirit is there to accomplish this task. Mm-hmm. It will never be mine. Right. Our function is the forgiveness. Our, as, as, as the saviors of the world, our function is forgiveness in this perceptual world. And really, that's the main thing. Right. That's it. Yeah. As long as we're in the perceptual world, we're in a loony bin, and we have to just say, okay, well, crazy people acting crazy. Luckily, there is that holy instant as a reign of grace constant. Mm-hmm. And if I can quit jamming it with crazy messages, it will come in. And that's where, the, I guess, faith comes in. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it does. Okay. Okay. Is that good? I think so. <laughs> Thank you, everyone.